Thanks for tuning in to The Real Deal Show, brought to you by ebodyboarding.com and Tribe Boards. Hey folks, Jay Real back at you with another episode of The Real Deal Show, and I am back in my hometown of Ocean City, Maryland, with some people that are very special to me. They have a big part in getting me to where I am today, but more specifically, the beginning of my bodyboarding career. This is Kathy and Jeff Phillips. Welcome, guys. Hey, Jay. Welcome to Casa Phillips. <laughs> now, I will say this is our second take because my microphones <laughs> didn't work the first time. And the last time I set up to interview these Third guys, take. I got violently ill. <laughs> Literally, as I was setting up the mic, that was last May. Yep. A year and, ago. Uh, yeah, I ate at a food truck and just got insane. We I had to usher house, you. That's, that's right. Your house. In California. And I had to usher them out the door very quickly. <laughs> To blow chunks ten seconds <laughs> after they step foot off the, uh, we felt the so porch. bad for you. <laughs> I felt bad for you. You were of, you were so green. Oh man, that you was a bad well, twenty four hours. Have, we would have wondered, but you were obviously ill. It was yeah, apparent. You could see, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. There was no question. That, Does Jay really want to do this with us? That oh no, he's insane. very sick. <laughs> um, yeah, I was out for like a whole day. Um, yeah. But anyway, we are. Um, I'm just stoked to have you guys together here. It's obviously been a long time coming uh, to get you guys on the Real Deal show. Jeff loves being on camera. You'll see uh, how much he <laughs> mugs to the to the lens. Kathy, very experienced at this sort of thing. So what we're gonna do, guys, we're gonna get into the history of, you know, how you guys got started as a couple, where you're from, and all that stuff. But what that leads to is you guys were the directors of the Eastern Surfing Association, Delmarva District, when I moved here to Ocean City, and you guys were big supporters of bodyboarding, mm -hmm. and as I mentioned, you guys had an instrumental part in kind of me getting started competitively and where that led to me in my life, but what I want to hear about is the origin story of Kathy and Jeff Phillips, because I come from the Washington, D.C. area. I was born in Silver Spring. I grew up in rockville which is next to silver spring and you guys are from the same area right yeah we're both from the silver spring area um i grew up in a little community called four corners and jeff grew up just a few miles up the road from me in an area called white oak okay i've and, heard of white oak yeah and we met in high school uh, we were both going to the same high school and uh, high school sweethearts oh mm, <laughs> no, we weren't <laughs> So Actually, did you, you dated in high school? We went briefly. out briefly. But yeah, why briefly? I don't think I was quite, hey, watch that face. You, you were into the <laughs> cheerleader type? He, yeah, he was more in, I, I'm and not you quite weren't sure what the he was type? I was that... not the cheerleader type, no. Um, but we were, in, we were taking the same art class together. Okay. And uh, anyway, we, we um, you know, we, we, sort of had the same friends in high school, same same group of people, so we still knew each other. You hung in the but, same circles. Right, but we didn't less, yeah. we didn't really start dating until we both were at University of Maryland College Park. But in and, high school, like what's did you um we as I mentioned, we started the interview <laughs> earlier and the audio was screwed up, but you mentioned he was a gymnast. He was. That's what attracted me to him. <laughs> you like the <laughs> tight the biceps white, and the yeah, tight the uniform. Big shoulders, little waist. And, and you the... were doing the iron crosses. Yeah, Not yeah. even. It wasn't no. that good. <laughs> you couldn't still do an iron cross? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but the still rings was your thing. Yep. I did the still rings. Did you do all the events? I, you know, we had, back then we actually had a competitive team from the high school. Okay. And we competed against other teams and... It was a lot like um, like swim meets or something. You needed to fill a certain number of spots, yeah. And you got points even if the person that filled it didn't do yes. terribly well. But if yep. they didn't did it, you didn't get anything. Got nothing. So I would be called upon to do vaulting <laughs> or floor exercise or something like that occasionally. The pommel horse seems like the hardest. No, pommel horse. Pommel horse is really hard. It seems that insane. Is really hard. Yeah. Um, that and. Uh, yeah, some of those things, uh, palm horse and the and the uh, horizontal bar, those, yeah. those were high risk and hard. <laughs> but that yeah. set you up to be a good surfer, which we're going to get into in a minute. But Kathy, what were you doing in high school? What kind of girl were you? Arts, sports, 
Yeah, no. Nerd. I was, yeah, I, I wasn't nerd. I wasn't sports. I'm not quite sure what I was in high school, to tell you the truth. Um, I was into the music scene a little bit. And, and you know, it's this greatly aging, both of us now, but um, junior high and er, early years of high school was the whole hoot nanny scene. Oh, man. And so. Flat, so yep, like beatnik you know, kind of thing? Uh, not, not so well, much that. Not so much Folk beatnik. music kind yeah. of thing? Yeah, folk music. And, I, you know, I played guitar. Oh, wow. And, uh, and so my circle of friends, you know, were all into the whole, um, uh, you know, Kings. Oh boy, I, Kingston so, Trio. Like Peter nobody Paul out there is even going to know who. Oh, you know, you'd Kingston be surprised. Trio is. <laughs> but um, you'd be surprised. Yeah, and um, and so I, actually, this was before Jeff and I even met. Yeah. Um, I had seen him. So in tenth grade, I was at a different high school, um, and then eleventh and twelfth grade, I moved over to Springbrook High School and, and to that area, and so that's when I really met Jeff. But okay. first time I ever saw Jeff was a gym meet at the high school I was going to, Northwood High School. And uh, yeah, I was like, okay, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta remember he's your this man. guy. <laughs> and you probably had like long blonde hair. No, it wasn't long then. No, 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 no. You couldn't get away with it. You couldn't, you couldn't have oh, long right, hair right, because you were a stinking the hippie teach, back in those teachers, days, right? Would, teachers would get after you if your hair touched the tops of your ears. Yeah, oh, yeah. sure. Definitely it's got to be high have, and tight. Yeah, could not could not have long hair back then. But I, Nobody yeah. did, really. You right. we were talking 19... 64, 65, uh, Now he just, he just gave up your secret. Yeah, so I know. We're talking <laughs> way, I was way born back, in 64. Way, way, way yeah. back machine, yeah. <laughs> no, but, uh, uh, yeah. But I, I would go down, I, me and my friends, we'd go down to Georgetown yeah. uh, to catch, you know, Joan Baez and, and uh, you know, so many of the groups that would play at the, the cellar door was, you know, one of, the, and we were too young to even go into the cellar door, we had to have a friend of ours have her mom take us. Oh, that wow. was the only way we could get oh. into the cellar door. Oh, they let things. you in with the chaperone yeah. kind of oh, thing. So, See, so we all had fake IDs so oh, we could get in. Because <laughs> yeah, you only this, had to be 18 in D.C. Yeah, but this right. was more like junior high, so I was only like 14, 15, so yeah. couldn't oh, really yeah, okay. get away with the fake. That The whole fake ID thing was later. Right. But, um, but my friend, whose mother would take us, she was part of a folk singing group that I was part of, um, <laughs> the Ramblin' Five, <laughs> and it so was you, five girls. And you play guitar. And we'd play guitar and sang, and wow. you know we we. But anyway, this friend of mine, um, and she was very tall and had a very deep voice, so she sang all the bass notes. Oh, okay. You know, um, but anyway, her name was Anna Lou Leibowitz, okay. who everybody now knows as the famous photographer Annie yeah. Leibowitz. Oh no way! But she lived in my neighborhood, and you know, there's a group of us that you know grew up junior high and tenth grade, um, you know, being friends, tight wow. circle. And um, yeah, and then you know we all just went on to live sort of normal lives, and Anna and Lou she became went on Annie. To and take pictures of all the famous <laughs> yes music artists. <laughs> yeah, and. Wow. Um, it was fun following her for you know for a while, yeah. but anyway, it was uh, it was Annie or Anna Lou's mom that would take us down to the cellar door. This group of you know fourteen, fifteen year old girls, <laughs> yeah, just so we could go hear all these folk artists that uh, that we tried to emulate. But now you've like I had no idea you had a musical background because I've never seen you play guitar no. or sing. You just gave it no, up cold gave, turkey. Yeah, I. Uh -oh. at, at some point in high school, gave, gave up the whole... Well, actually, no, I gave up guitar. Okay. Um, but there was a short time period during um, freshman year of college uh, where I sang with a, um, a small group called the Lamplighters. Don't you love this? Wow. Rambling oh, yeah. And Lamplighters, we, uh, the guy who uh, started that group did the... I don't know, not xylophone, but maybe that is what Vibraphone, it was called. Vi it's pretty similar the, to xylophone. You know, the big keyboard like yeah. thing, but with, uh, with hammers. hammers yeah. yeah. And um, another guy played stand up bass. And so I sang like jazz numbers and yeah. popular songs Girl from Ipanema wow. and yes, When Sunny Gets Blue and I stuff think... like that. And, and 
we would play bar mitzvahs and and yeah. and cocktail parties American and things Legions. like that. <laughs> New Year's <laughs> Eve parties, yes. yeah. And um, so at that point, I was going to college uh, briefly in West Virginia. Oh, but. Uh, we were dating at that point, I think, so I would be coming back on the weekends to play with the lamplighters and get to see Jeff. <laughs> Karaoke night in your future. Yeah. Look out, I'm going to rope you in. Uh, not but, his, but... but you, <laughs> no musical no, talent I whatsoever. No, I, 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 I don't even sing in the not. shower anymore, so... Um, I, I can't even sing shame. to myself near her because... It's oh, apparently she'll so judge you. Oh no, bad. he's so off key. Just oh no! In his head, he's hearing it. It sounds so, great to yeah. me. Inside, no, yeah, in my right? Head, sound like well, no. Um, I I know that's because uh, I love to sing. I've been singing all my life, and Vicky, uh, she doesn't. She doesn't. She doesn't want to be judged. So she try. You know, she'll sing occasionally, but and I. You know, she's just self-conscious about it. But just, it's always good I, to sing. I am no... Have a song I, I in your heart. Cannot. Yeah. Yeah. Just <laughs> don't, don't, myself, ask, yeah. don't ask. Don't ask. It's in my head right now. Yeah. Yeah. No. So, um, so, you, anyway, so, so, yeah, go ahead. So we, Continue the story. Know, we started together again. Uh, it was my sophomore year at Maryland. Right. Yep. And, what um, were you studying, by the way? Uh, I was an English major at that point. Yep. And... Uh, With a view to do what? I have no idea. You had no had idea. No you were idea. just going to college to <laughs> but, go to college. Oh, you were so, you were going to stay so, in that so, whole academic so, track. So here's <laughs> what happens: is I, I I go to Maryland in my freshman year. Um, I almost f flunk out the first semester. In the second semester, I somehow I got into um, I think it was an honors course, and from flunking I, out to honors, I, I aced it. Wow! And and I was like, oh, this. Maybe I should just go with this thing that I'm good at. Oh, right. So I became an English major because, as it turns out, it kind of suited me, and I was pretty good at it. I didn't have any problems with it, and you know, and I had other things I, I took, but I was an English major. You know, I, I, I still remember, and, and this this is rooted in my memory, which was at one point when we were living in Florida after we'd gotten married. And we're applying for food stamps. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and the person yeah. who's interviewing us says, so, so you're an English major. Are you a writer? And I looked at her and I said, no. <laughs> that was the end of that. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. You know, I, I had no idea. Now, yeah, it was, you know, I got accepted to grad school. I mean, I could have continued into grad school and gone the whole academic track. But I really, I hate Hated grad school. He could have been I was so Jeff ready Phillips, to get PhD. Out of there. And yeah. Wow. yeah. But I mean, we were in Ocean City at that point, especially yeah. like summertime. Yes. We had jobs. We were it working was downtown. We came to Ocean City. Yeah. Okay, so let me ask you, why did you come to Ocean City? Because I wanted to surf. How surf. did you get into the surf, the surf world? You didn't. We oh, skipped we over skipped that. that, didn't we? Okay. Yeah. So what brought right, you well, that's here? Because she was telling her story. Uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> now you get to tell your. We'll do story. some edits. No, yeah. just kidding. So, yeah. in my high school, um, this guy showed up who was supposedly from California, and he surfed. And there was kind of a buzz. A few of my friends, everybody was like, "Oh, yeah, that's fine, cool." And the, of course, the Beach Boys and everything were very right. popular. Surf back culture. Then. And. Um, I had these friends, um, guy Jeff Gillers and this guy John Lindsay, and John had a family in Ocean City, New Jersey, and Gillers was just an all-around athlete, and so the three of us, we were really interested in in surfing. Yeah. And so, I don't remember who did it first or where they did it, but John eventually wound up landing a contract to sell <coughs> surfboards hawaii surfboards and this was in the 60s so we're talking you know get called come over to my house i just got a shipment of new boards <laughs> and we're down in his face so unpacking oh. a shipment of brand new surfboards wow. hawaii surfboards triple wow. a models nose riders i mean these things were gorgeous i couldn't afford them i just was like it was like i gotta do this yeah. so i went out and i i bought a pop out for 55 bucks wow. and my family would always go to North Carolina in the summer. Yep. Took that pop out down there, and I paddled out, and I caught a wave. Because the thing was giant. It was gigantic. It was like the size of what people 
do stand up paddle on now. Oh wow. I caught a wave. I, I think I may have caught one or two waves. I'm paddling back out and a guy runs over me and hits me in the head and I come up my head First session. beating. Oh, my <laughs> I wound up having to get three stitches and couldn't go back in the water for the rest of my vacation. <laughs> oh my gosh. And, but I was hooked at that point. Yeah, because I was going to say, that will eat, turn you one of two ways. Forget this sport, this sucks, or I'm hooked well, and the, I want to do the more. The family vacations at the beach were great. I loved being at the beach. But except for fishing, which I did a little bit of, th there was nothing really to do there. I mean, I felt like, you know, here I, w here I was at this place that just seemed really cool to me, but yeah. I didn't have anything to do. And right. you know, I could go out and swim around and whatever. Yeah. And all of a sudden I had the two things connected, the beach and surfing. And from then on, it was, it was, it was game on. I mean, you know, I would go, go surfing whenever I could. And, you know, I, I still remember Gillers and I actually hitchhiked to Ocean City one time from Silver Spring. Oh, my god! We hitchhiked all night long to get there. Did you have surfboards with no, you? No, we didn't have surfboards at that time. But we just had to get there. And it's just one of those things that you just, I don't know, for me, surfing was just, it was perfect. It was an obsession. It was, it was an obsession. Well, I, and every time I'd go surfing, I'd go with my friends. Yeah. And we'd go somewhere and we would camp and, you know, we would have campfires and eat Dindy Moore beef, beef <laughs> stew, you know, that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and it was, we'd go to the Outer Banks or we'd go somewhere and surf and it was just, it was just the best time yeah. ever was uh -huh. to go surfing. And I mean... I think everyone watching knows exactly what you mean. And, the and camaraderie. My, my surfing yeah. experiences were horrible because no leashes, you know... You, <laughs> Giant you, boards. No wetsuits no wet to speak oh of. And you'd paddle out and you'd lose your board and it would go all the way in. And by the time you got in, if the water was cold, you were just a blue shivering chunk. And you were done for the day, but... You'd still go back and do it again the next day yeah. and do the same thing over and over and over wow. again and never be dissuaded. But and that and was and then it. and he got me interested. Oh, so in you surfing. dragged her into it. Yeah, is that it? and um, what my first board was a carbon was it Carbonel. a Carbonell, and um, and. And that was from Caravan Surf Shop yeah, in, in, in College Park. Park. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. Uh, Jimmy Finnegan and no, uh, Blair Rose. No, Car oh, Caravan, Caravan was, was Don Geezy was okay. his name. Yeah. And um, we, that was, it's funny because we made, and I guess everybody else is the same way, you make connections with people through surfing. Yeah. And they last through your entire life. Yeah. I mean, here's Caravan Surf Shop in um, College Park, 130 Maryland. miles from the beach, by <laughs> right. the way, which and, was groundbreaking at that time. There weren't shops that right. far inland. And that's what was so exciting. I mean, I still remember when I first got into surfing, we would hear rumors that there were surfboards somewhere and we would drive there <laughs> to go see just what they looked smell like. smell them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, so, yeah, surf touch wax them. But Caravan, yeah. through Caravan, I wound up meeting Rich Peralski, who he moved here and he he's became a very successful attorney in Ocean City, mm -hmm. and Dave Dalkowitz, yeah. who came down here and opened his shop, Ocean, Ocean Atlantic, Atlantic yeah. surf, surf Shop. So, you know, and those guys, they're still my friends, but I met them, this would have been, you know, before we even got Late married. 60s, Late 60s, yeah. 68, and, wow. and 69. So, yeah. And um, so that's, you know, when I talk, we talk about surfing, you talk about the camaraderie and the friendships, they stay with you. Oh yeah, and it's just. And our and our yeah. first year of college, what would have been my, it would have been yours. You were into like your two and a half years of college, I guess, and I was one year in. Anyway, we were living with a group of people in College Park or Tacoma Park mm -hmm. near the University of Maryland, mm -hmm. and and a bunch of the guys there surfed, and we used to go off on surf trips. Yep. Uh, Jay yep. Donahue had just gotten back from the Vietnam War and he was, he he was, was on the GI vet. Bill going to University of yep. Maryland. And so we would go down to Georgia uh, where he used to be stationed and surf down there. And, and I'll never forget that at that point I was definitely hooked on the surfing. And we did that trip to Georgia and I got the worst sunburn because I just stayed in the water like the uh, whole time we were yeah. down there. And 
my face was peeling and my hands yeah. were peeling. And <laughs> this is back when cocoa butter but, was but, your... Uh, yeah, exactly. There was no sunblock. No sun, sunblock. Sun you know, sun, no. Of. And, uh, <laughs> and I was working as a, at a bank as yep. an assistant to the manager at the bank. And, and I came into work that Monday and, I mean, literally skin was just falling off of me onto his paperwork like, on the home. table. And he was like, just get, You're gonna scare get customers out of here. Away. <laughs> I mean, I was, uh, yeah. that, and that was, and that was when I did, after that, I started seeking out, uh, back I, then it was copper I pen. Had, I but had another story to, like that, which was when I was still in high school and I'd started doing the surfing, was going to the beach and... I was coming home and I, because the boards were so big, you could knee paddle them. Yeah. And guys would get surf knots. Yeah. I would get <laughs> on these the knees open sores on the tops of my t foot. And because they were open, oozy sores, they would get sand in them. Oh, yeah. So I would come yeah. back. I couldn't even wear shoes because I'd have these giant sand filled sores like you get from the fins, <laughs> yeah. I guess, right? Swim fin and, yeah. ulcers, and we call them. I'd, yeah. I'd have to go to work and I would just be like, Oh, oh my, my god! My summer job, you know? but it was so worth it. <laughs> it was so worth it because it was yeah. surfing. But eventually, in Ocean City, when we were living here, um, I I got uh, just frustrated with the surfing because number one, there weren't that many girls surfing. I wasn't that good at mm. all then. I just liked doing it, and. Um, I was always getting run over by guys out in the water and, and you know, just Were they it, giving it you the fun. dirty looks? Oh and yeah, no yeah. Not not giving me yeah, not giving me any. But wow. Tom Mori came so different now. But then Tom Mori came along. Oh, with and, the bodyboard. Yeah. And I switched from surfboard to the um, boogie. To the boogie, the Mori boogie. And while he had to wait during the day and couldn't get out, I was out. Oh, long. so they had that rule all the way back then. <laughs> well, it's yeah. It's essentially yeah. a black ball here in Ocean yeah. City. You couldn't Ocean surf. City, yeah. yeah, in it Ocean was City. At, at one point. In the summer during the at day. At one point early, I think it was like around 1970, there was still the north end of the town was open mm -hmm. from like 100 and... Actually, from about 94th, 94th Street, Street north, north to the Delaware line was not really developed and so you had to go up there to go surfing that was all through the 60s was like that and then it reached a point where any the city said well if it's an open lot you can still surf there so they would have there would be these open stretches in ocean city where you could surf but the rest of the time when the guards were on you couldn't so even then there was a essentially a black ball mm -hmm. yep. yeah and um but anyway we we came down here in the 70s because i wanted to surf and i was a terrible surfer Terrible. So you were a terrible surfer, but you wanted to live at the beach so you could get better. But exactly, what was your plan for employment when you got here? You had your English degree. We had no plan. No plan. I mean, we had no plan. We had just gotten married, and we said, "Screw everything. We'll find we're jobs. going to the beach, and we'll find jobs." Okay. And we found these terrible jobs, and on the uh, board, you know, boardwalk stores. Sure. Oh, God. Yeah. And um, about midway through, Kathy found us jobs working at a restaurant which meant we finally were able to eat. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and, and have cash and at have the cash end of the day. Right. And tips. Yeah. Because we continued to pay rent on our place in Tacoma Park oh. over the summer because of all our friends were still living there. And I, <clears throat> I was, I'd applied to grad school and, you know, got the letter in August, hey, you've been accepted to graduate school. And I was like, oh, man, that means I have to leave. <laughs> I really didn't bummed. want to go home. Yeah, yeah. right. And so after, and that was another situation. The, the guy that we rented uh, our room from in Ocean City became essentially a lifelong friend. He's passed away now. But through his family, we would come back down every summer and work for his family, work for him or his family. Um, they owned um, Talbot Street. Uh, they owned um, the Nordica Hotel, the Belmont, Belmont Hotel. Hotels over on Dorchester Street. Yep. And... Um, we would show up and, you know, work from, you know, whenever we could show up and we would do things like paint rooms, install air conditioners, you know, take rooms apart in the fall, put them together uh -huh. in the spring, you know, and, and then we'd stay there all summer working. And I mean, you know, it was working, great get in the water you know, every day. Uh, yeah. 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 I, I was living downtown and I would get up in the morning and I would walk down to the inlet and go surfing. 
I could walk to the inlet and surf every morning. I, you know, that's where I met people like Mark Elliott and some of the other local guys yeah. around here, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just, it was, it was amazing. And, and I actually got somewhat better at surfing. But in 1970, that was in 1970, I walked down to the inlet and there was a contest going on. And it was, uh, I think Skill and Al Johnson were running an ESA contest. Wow. And I signed <clears throat> up to surf. Uh, I paddled out. I didn't know what I was doing. And I, you know, I, I surfed and I surfed against Chris Politis. Um, and of course, Chris won because he was very accomplished. And I, every, I came in, everybody was like, oh, you did great. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, <laughs> I don't even know what I did. <laughs> but, but it was contest surfing that really helped him improve and, yeah. and get good. Well, yeah, because, and every surfer knows this, there comes a point in time where you come in from the, being in the water and you say to your wife or girlfriend, did you see that wave? <laughs> and she goes... Yeah, and you know, <laughs> and you know she's lying. Yes, and you know she doesn't want to watch you surfing anymore, and so she's not going to be any help. Right. And so you've got to figure out a way if you want to. If you're like us and you grew up away from the ocean, yeah. I mean, I got down here and all these local kids were already so good. Yeah, and you know, Eric Green, Mark Badolas, they were kids and they were just killing it. Yeah, and I got down here and I was like, God, I couldn't. You know, I didn't know didn't even really know what I was doing out yeah. there. But I started the started doing the contests because I thought, well, if I do a contest heat, I come in, I can look at a judge's sheet, I can have somebody tell me some feedback. This worked. And if I can beat somebody, I know I surfed well enough to beat this person. And so that was what was going through my head was I wanted to get better. And I so contest surfing was a way for me to do it and, and yep. have legitimate validation rather than coming in and ask, sure. asking somebody, some stranger on the beach, hey, how did I look? Yeah, <laughs> because there were no video cameras back no, then, so no, you didn't have footage right. of yourself no. and feedback in that respect, because you could do that now without competing, just get someone to video you and, oh boy, I really look lame on that wave, but you, you I was good on that You need that, you can get one of those automatic things that, you know, you solo shot. Solo shot, yep. And yeah, you, you don't even need a person yourself. on the beach, you just need a rock to tie it but, to. But that time yeah. period of the 70s was us, you know, him going to graduate school and us working here in the summertime. But by the mid to late seventies, we had pretty much decided, no, this is this is where we want to be. It. You know, dealing with the traffic back and forth yeah. and the backups and everything. And um, so I, I remember we were. Uh, it was the middle of winter, and, and we were out standing in the middle of Baltimore Avenue yeah. in like January, and it was absolutely no other ice cars, cold, nothing, no cars, crystal clear. You could see all the stars. And I lay down in the middle of Baltimore Avenue. Because that's how that's Good. how dead yeah. Because you couldn't City do it was. now. Really? Yeah. Yep. Oh. Lay down in the middle. I was like, okay, I think I want to live here. I think we want to stay here. And so we started scheming. You know, how can we do this? Because the jobs were either service industry or farming, basically. Oh right. And, and I said to him, well, you could teach. And so that sent us back to College Park for him to now oh. get a degree in education. Yes. So we were back in College Park for two years, and then yep. by '79, we <coughs> we came came down here. The summer so, of '79, well, but, we but packed what it you're all missing up. Is but hold on, yeah, go ahead. I have a question <laughs> for after you. After I got that teaching certification, actually before oh, I even yeah. graduated, Prince George's County hired me because I was in elementary ed, and I was male, and so I got a job teaching in PG County where I taught for for. Two, uh, years. two years. Yeah. Wow. And um, took you away from your dream for a little yeah. while. Yeah. Well, I've still come down come in the down summer. Come down in the summer. We've okay. worked for the Buntings for the, the summer, Jones family in the summer. At the end of two years, I was just like, this isn't working. You know, we'd drive. I remember one, one time, you know, Friday, front was supposed to be going through, got <laughs> off work, drove down here as fast as we could get here. Pulled up at the inlet, you know, and the wind had gone offshore, and it was like about this big. Uh, you know, it had just blown out that right. fast. And we turned, turned around, around and drove and all the way back, back to College said, Park. Because there, there were no surf cams, no surf reports, yeah, well, nothing like that back yeah. then. And I was like, this isn't working. So she borrowed a horse trailer and a truck from her friend, 
who had a horse farm. We put all our belongings in it. All our worldly belongings. All our worldly <laughs> belongings in the spring of 79 and moved to the beach. And Kate, who had the hotel, gave us a place to stay. And we went to work for her. And um, I can't remember what we did with all our stuff. Well, you, and you just started applying to all the counties. Yeah, so I was going to I applied to Worcester. I didn't apply to anybody else. So no, you, you did. quit working for Prince yeah. George's County. Yeah. You just said, I'm done. Yeah. I'm moving to the beach. The, so my question, just going back a little, is you went back to College Park to get a University of Maryland to get your teaching credential. Why didn't you go to Salisbury and stay here at the beach and just commute to um, Salisbury? I did, it did, Wasn't it didn't on your radar? It didn't even yeah. occur to me. Because that was like and, a teacher's college originally. Yeah, yeah. That's what it was known for, right? I know. So, and yeah. I, it's, it's, you know, when you mention that, I mean, it didn't even occur to me. I don't think it even and occurred maybe to us. it was us. because Maryland was, you know, a comfortable to me. I was used to That's University word, of Maryland college. Comfortable. Yeah. I knew my way around. Yeah. And, of course, our families were back there. Right. So it meant, you know, if we needed a safety net, it was a lot easier to get back yeah. there. You know, we could beg money or get a place to stay <laughs> or, or meal, something. Yeah. Do my laundry. Yeah. No. <laughs> so you ended up here in 79. 79. Permanently. You quit PG County. You applied for... Teaching jobs in this area, and Worcester County. Nothing. All summer, did not hear anything. It got into September. and School started, and school you still started, hadn't been and Somebody hired said, yet. well, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know, but I'm not going back. I mean, I was determined I was I mean, not going back. there's always bartending. Back. Sure. You know. I was bartending, yeah. And uh, they called me up, and I got a job. English and, teacher at Stephen Decatur no, High School. Actually, uh, I was at Snow Hill, and I was oh. in a remedial program they were starting up. I student taught at Snow Hill. Yeah, yeah. and they, uh, I remember at, at the job interview that I had at the board, they were like, well, this is a program that's funded by a grant. And, <clears throat> you know, the grant runs out in two years. So why are you applying for the job? And I said, well, I need a job. And I know if I'm good, you'll find a way to keep me. Wow. I have no idea where Very that brash. came from. It <laughs> came out of my head and out of my mouth. But they were impressed, and they hired me. Wow. And then what was really nice was uh, I was down at Snow Hill for two years. And then Gladys Burbage, our principal, Yeah. she had heard about me or something. Maybe I'm, I keep wondering if maybe Sterner hadn't. You know, put a bug in her ear. Said, mm -hmm. "Hey, I've got this friend who's teaching down." And there. you also were a male. Terry teacher. Sterner was my English yeah. teacher. Yeah, yeah. And, um, at Stephen Decatur. So they high um, school. They snatched me away, and I moved up to Stephen Decatur, and I was there till the spring of twenty nineteen. How many yeah. years teaching then? Thirty? <clears throat> no, no. forty two and a half Holy years of teaching. Holy smokes, man! <laughs> that is, you deserve like a bronze star for that. No, not really. <laughs> teaching people, for that when, many years. People ask me about that. You know what I tell them? I tell them, teaching at Steve Decatur was the best gig you could ever want. Wow. I mean, yeah, there'd be rough patches, but, oh God, the kids were nice. I mean, the first few years, they were all the same kids that you know who were the surfing with Jack or Jack Crosby's Bombers team. Yeah. And I'd see them every day and we would see each other and we'd see each other in the water. And um, the kids at Stephen Decatur are really nice. So you had street cred in the early days because you were a surfer. A little bit. Right? And, he, a little bit. and he started a surf club at Stephen Decatur. Oh. Yeah, I did have a surf club for a while. Okay. And, and we'd take them camping. we oh, take... Yeah. All the kids we, camping on Outer Banks. Wow, you can never at do Easter that now. Break. <laughs> uh, I think that was after you had graduated. Because, I graduated in '82. Yeah, because yeah. it was like Chris Freeman, Chris Street, uh, Gary Hastings, Gary Hastings. Yeah, and if you recall, at Easter everybody would go down to the Outer Banks, mm -hmm. and the parent the parents would help the kids rent a house, and the houses were usually pretty debauched, drinking. <laughs> God knows what. <laughs> and it bugged me. You know, I didn't think that was a good atmosphere for kids. I thought they should go be able to have fun without doing that. And so we started, we took a group of kids and we went down and we camped. And the kids came with us and they had tents and 
we set up camp and we and I would take them. We would go surfing over at the. It was surf, the eat, sleep, surf, eat, yeah. sleep. And, yeah. Um, yeah. I so I we did that this year, and I did that for three or four years. Took took a group of kids with us. She would come with us, and we would take them down, and we would either camp or rent a house. Yeah. And it would just be a surf club trip. Awesome. And we would just surf, like she said, surf, eat, sleep, wow. get sunburned. I remember Gary Hastings got a terrible sunburn one time because it was, oh, um, God, well, I can't think of his name right now. But anyway, it got so warm on the Frisco side, everybody was surfing in trunks at Easter. And they all, oh. nobody had been in the sun oh, all winter and they man. all got burnt to a crisp. Oh, um, Ronnie Fields was there too. Yeah. All those names. And, and you, you know, this, uh, this is, I finished high school in 82 and then went to college at Salisbury. And you had started, both of you, well, let's go, before yeah, I get into this, let's go back, back to ESA. So how did ESA come into your lives? How did you end up taking that over? Because that was around yeah. 1980, right after you moved here. Yeah, I, well, I started surfing ESA contests, like I said, to get better. Yeah. <clears throat> and Dave Dalkowitz was the ESA director. And he was struggling with it, and he needed some help. So I, I started helping him with Bef the contest. Before we even moved down yeah, there. Okay. Before, yeah, we'd come down we in the summer and help him run the contests. And um, eventually, I just said, hey, let me take it over. I can do this. And um, so I got, you know, went to the Easterns that fall. I guess that was... Was that 79? That yeah, was, was probably 79. 79 yeah. and, uh, you know, got voted in as ESA director. And um, Now, this know. is a volunteer position. Like, yeah. you volunteered your time. Yeah. 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 Nobody's, um, it's not like you're going, oh, I'm going to make some money no, out of this. It's like no, no yeah. salary, the exact no, opposite of that. You're no. giving of your but free Do time. Dokowitz had been very canny with the money that he got from the entry fees and trophies so he had a war chest so i was able to take that money and buy trophies and buy some equipment and help to build the district up a little bit yeah you know because you you you're self-supporting i mean you know if you're spending two thousand dollars on trophies for these contests you got to make two thousand dollars in entry fees yeah or you're you're not going to be able to buy them and so i started out doing contests running the contests and, and actually, I think it was my first contest, or maybe, no, it was like a second or third contest. Anyway, the one that happened um, in on July 19th. Yeah. And there was a contest that <laughs> wow. was, uh, well... Was we it, had a was contest scheduled uh, July. July 19th. No, of, it was after July 19th, because it was a week later, right? Okay. Well, we had a contest scheduled, and I was pregnant at the time, and, and due soon. And she had soon. Walker... And July yeah, 19th. And Walker was born on the 19th, and so, so we had to postpone the contest for one, <laughs> one but only one week. Nobody would and step then, up and say, We'll run the contest. Well, no, we, didn't, no. we didn't want to have to make anybody do that, but we called Spider Wright, and Spider got the word out to everybody. Thank you, Spider. <laughs> yeah, um, and um, you know, we postponed it for a week. And, and then we, there we were on the beach a week later, and, and I had Walker, Walker and little and, oh little and her mother Harry was there. Her mother was Mom like, was like, "I don't think this is a good idea," oh and I'm like, "It'll be fine." Put the basket <laughs> under the table while she tabulates. Oh <laughs> my god, I love it! Um, and hence, our son grew up as a skateboarder and hated the beach. He hated did the beach. Not like this. He didn't want to be anywhere near the sand. He traumatized yeah. him from an early yeah. age. <laughs> That's funny. Wow. But I'm glad he's a skater. He, 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 skateboarding did the same thing for him that surfing did. Yeah. I mean, right. Same thing with those friends he's yeah. bonded with. A little brotherhood going on there. Yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, it's and he's great. still friends with some of those guys, you know, all yeah. these years later. And plus for us trying to run the contests, Ocean City has this amazing skate park. And back then it was much smaller than it is now. But it was a really good group of older guys that oh, managed God, yes. the park. Yeah. So on days when we had surf contests, we literally could just, just leave drop Walker them off at and the would... skate park. And I knew that he'd be safe, you know, all day long. And yeah. then we'd pick him up after the contest she was would, over. Yeah. She'd call the skate park and she'd hear the guy take the, take the phone away and go, 
Walker, it's your mommy. <laughs> they, they were merciless with each yeah. other. Oh, uh, sure. That was, uh, that was a great, great group of human beings. I'll tell yeah. you. Yes, that's yeah. like the Josh Marlowe, Mark Eamon yeah. days. Yeah, yep. yep. exactly. That crew. Yeah, wow, that's so funny. So you guys were running the ESA. And this was, um, you know, this is where kind of I come into the story. Right. I don't want to make this about me, but let's let's see where this goes because we're dovetailing into my story where I arrived in 1980 and I got into bodyboarding much the same feeling that you guys had. Like, this is what I need to be doing for the rest of my life. Yeah. I'm hooked. I love the culture. I love being in the ocean every day. So... Naturally, I looked for opportunities to get immersed in that culture. The Eastern Surfing Association, Association that year, you guys started a boogie division. But, Talk about that. But that, that boogie division only really came about because of you. I mean, you know. It, Jay <laughs> and Mary Lee Christensen bringing the, well, the Maury yes. tour here to right. Ocean City. Yes. Yep. Um, and the Maury tours came and... But it was also, it was Jay and all of the kids that were friends with him, the Billy the, Wilkins, Mike Strawley, all those kids, they were all, they were bodyboarding because you could bodyboard all day in the summer. Right. And you couldn't surf. Yep. And they were fanatical about it. And, I mean. But it was the Maury tour that really made us realize that, there's oh, a lot of yeah. we can, we can. Do competitive bodyboarding. Yeah, Patty Serrano and, was the first yes. to bring it here, and that's when I showed up. Yeah. Showed up, and so you guys I saw a need for Patty. it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And we also saw, you know, we had a lot of pressure from you guys, which was a good thing. I mean, I can remember kind of being like <sighs> bodyboarding. <laughs> you know, it's like number one, it adds more to the contest, so it's more to do. But the yeah. other was, you know, frankly. You know, as a surfer, we're all a little suspicious of body. Of course, initially. a little suspicious you know, is putting it nicely. Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, it's just a bunch of body boogie boarders, but as you call us. Yeah, you you can't deny the enthusiasm and the energy, and. And, and you know, I was bodyboarding. That's right. Your significant <laughs> yeah. other here right. was it, like, it, we it can was, do this. It was one of those things where it's just like, and and you know, we're like, oh my god, these guys start bodyboarding. Some of them are going to surf, but this they'll still be coming to the contest. We had all those kids and all the BB Bombers team. It was just, you know, that's all of those kids. And uh, so, so there was there was a place for it. There you was know? a place. Yeah. And and, and the, actually, some we have to give some credit to Pete Pan up in yeah. I was going to say Pete, England, Pete Pan ESA started a and, and boogie was division. Was Mr. Beach was doing yeah, it. And yeah. Had, uh, Bobby Hovey. Mm -hmm. And I, there was another guy there. Was, There's a few Eric Anderson, Eric Jim Anderson, Conway. Yeah, There's yeah. A, uh, yeah. the list goes on. Um, but yeah. And so it kind of it all arose kind of spontaneously almost, and and. Uh, we pushed for it, and I think that at that time, Doc was still... When did you take He it? was. He was still running it. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, the recognition became obvious from some of the district directors, and, oh, my God, there's this untapped potential of kids Especially out there. for membership. Who, yeah, for know, sure. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Can't surf yet. You know, you can, you can get a 12-year-old out there on a bodyboard, and he can have a blast. Yeah. Or she can have a blast, but... They may not be able to afford or be able to start surfing. Yes. So, so with yep. it with it happening up in New England, happening in the Mid Atlantic area with us, um, I don't know that it was happening quite so much down in Florida, mm. but definitely um, I think one of the South Car maybe South Carolina or Georgia they started doing it. So anyway, there were enough of us district directors that we finally felt we could take it to the to the ESA board, which of course the Eastern Surfing Association board of directors were all the volunteer district directors that were running the program up and down the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And uh, if there were going to be any changes made to the competition program, you know, it had we had to reach consensus with everybody yeah. and, and be able to add it. So um, it was Pete Pan and Jeff and maybe somebody from Virginia Beach that uh, one year at mm -hmm. the 
at the Easterns brought it up at the Harry Perky at that time. Yeah, board of directors meeting and said, you know, we need to add this as a division to the ESA and uh, and so they they did vote it in. I unfortunately I don't know exactly what year that was, but maybe Yeah, well, 81? I think it was 81 because yeah. in 1980 the year I started only some districts, districts had a boogie division. It. Yeah. Then 81 more district, districts added it. And then I remember coming to you guys and saying, well, all these other divisions get to go to the Eastern Surfing Championships, right. but why don't we? We pay the membership fees and, and the and entry fees. And we wanted to see it come in because, you know, we, we wanted to see athletes like you and all these other kids who are now adults have that same opportunity as the surfers. But Doc, and we're talking about Dr. Colin Couture, who was the executive director of the ESA at that point, he saw it as a way to open up hundreds and hundreds of new memberships into mm. the ESA and sponsorship revenue through Churchill and yeah. through Maury Boogie. Yep. And um, so it all came together. It was, it was just the right time. Yeah. You know, it was definitely the right time to, to bring it on. So then in 82, the ESA championship said, we're going to have a boogie division. And so we had a, a pretty solid team here. Marco Riva, myself, Bill oh, Wilkins, God, yeah. Glenn oh, I Brown. I forgot Mike about Marco. We were some of the top yeah. riders from this area. And we went down to the ESA championships. We had no idea the level of talent outside of our little town here, right? right? So we didn't know if in the surfing world, the Floridian guys were like the yeah. guys to beat, right? You knew they were going to field the best surfers. But what about bodyboarding? We had no clue. So we showed up at the event, and I remember um, so I had this repertoire, drop knee, you know, I'd stand up on my bodyboard, and right before I was about to paddle out for my first heat, I forget the guy's name. Tom something was the was Tom the McLaren. event director. Tom McLaren was the yeah. event director, and he, I don't know if it was an arbitrary spur of the moment decision, but he said, no, "This is wasn't. the boogie division. You got to lay down. It was no not. standing up, no knee rides. It was. Yeah, not. how did that work out? I was I was politicking hard behind the scenes <laughs> for a couple of reasons. One was I knew if you allowed stand up that the surfers would just come in, grab a bodyboard from some kid off the beach, and go out there and stand up body bodyboard. Yes. And, and bear in mind, would, at this true. time frame, Kelly Slater was still surfing the ESA as a junior. Yes. Yep. And, you know, a number of other really good yeah. surfers. And like Kelly, you could, you know, he could probably stand up on a, you know, a dish tray, <laughs> yes. you know, and ride it. And, and so, but also, bodyboarding needed to be separate. It yeah. didn't yeah. need to be, like, surfing on a bodyboard it needed to be bodyboarding a real discipline yes and so i was politicking heavily and <clears throat> tom mclaren was he was easy to convince because he felt as i did that it would be really bad if it just turned into this thing where you know you had all these kids show up to bodyboard and then you had a bunch of surfers grab bodyboards and go out and stand up and hey i won the bodyboard right division. right so the lay, lay down thing and the swim fins kind of cemented it as its own sport yeah because i feel like the kneeboard division was like that it was mostly just surfers yeah yep who wanted another trophy so yep. they'd enter the kneeboard division there was really a very small handful of dedicated knee riders yeah. and, and only yeah. a couple of guys and from they eventually Jersey got and rid of them. Yeah, yeah exactly yeah. And so, yeah, and, and it, you know, so it basically meant that, you know, the people who were bodyboarding were bodyboarders and not... Yes. Yeah. Not, and and as a result sure. of that, I went in the final against Kelly, and Marco was in the final, guy from Maryland, and Sean Slater was also in the final, <laughs> and they couldn't stand up, which was their whole plan. Yeah. Just yeah. what you said. They were going to go out and stand up. And they probably would have won because surfers are going to like a guy standing up. Yeah, because the judges were pulled from the ranks. And so yes. the judges were all surfers themselves. And yes. they even had to be instructed, you know, here's what you're looking for. Yeah. They still do every day. I mean, right up until the last contest I ever ran, which was just a few years ago, you'd have to stand there and say, okay, here's what you're looking for when it came to the bodyboard. Yes. Because they just, you know. 
I must say, since I started bodyboarding, it's pretty obvious to me what what's what's a good ride but yeah surfers just seem to have no concept and so for the judges <laughs> it had to be really yeah but black and but, white. but i have to say that during the um like the the 90s especially the 90s yeah. in the esa now this was after doc kutcher had passed away and i had now come in as the executive director of the whole esa and um, and we had new competition director who also appreciated bodyboarding as its own sport uh, because he came from a district where North Florida where they had a lot of good bodyboarders yeah. also, um, and so you know we we really started to push hard with the judging panels um, to get more bodyboarders during the bodyboard heats to get yeah. bodyboarders on the judging panels and then eventually. You know, when we went to pro judging panels, we actually had judges who bodyboarded themselves. Yeah. And um, and so I kind of feel like the 90s was really the heyday for competitive bodyboarding with the ESA. Yeah. And um, and then I don't quite know. What yeah. So we'll get in into that. that in a minute. But um, you guys ran the ESA religiously for... Initially, your initial run as directors lasted how many years? Uh, maybe 25, I think. Yeah, 20, 20 or 25. The last five, we were directors, but um, Ray Rickett yes. ran and, he and Art Beltrovsky was contest. running them, and, <laughs> we and had Chris other McKibben. doing the contests. Because by then I was executive director. Yeah, that's so a, that's trying a, to run the whole ESA plus plus this di district. And, and granted, running as executive director, that was a paid position. I mean, that was my job yeah. then. But then to also be putting in the volunteer time, you know, I I was happy to do the behind the scenes work with the district, but not actually be on the beach years, every she didn't day. Want to show up at the beach? Yeah. No. Well, that's a long <laughs> tenure to be doing that kind of volunteer work. Yeah, but. On, Weekends. Was, yeah, but you know what? Um, I mean, this is a, I shouldn't say maybe a big resort, but it really is a small hometown community. Yeah. And, and you know, everybody here has something that they really enjoy to do that they give back to. Yeah. And surfing, you know, was our thing. And, yeah, we there were many Friday nights getting ready for a contest where uh, it's a good thing you didn't have the a camera or a microphone set up here at the house, for lots sure. Of, yeah, lots of lots profanity. Like, R-rated. Like our, our yeah. son Walker would just head up to Nate's house and go, oh, Mom and Dad are getting ready for a contest, oh Mrs. My. Laird. Can I just stay here oh, for dinner tonight? That's you know, hilarious. <laughs> that sort of thing. But, wow. you know, it it's really small town community, and and we loved the kids, but we also knew their parents. And, mm. and then eventually, <clears throat> you know, the kids that had been competing with us were now parents themselves. And yes, now, I was going to say that for you know, that when, long. When we, towards the end, you know, we had little mini hoonies that actually were like second generation yeah. you know, for us. Um, so um, it just, it's it wasn't considered work for us. It was just, it was our way of giving back to the community. Yeah. And it, it also kept us connected with like Ocean City's political um, infrastructure, infrastructure yeah. um, you know, by going for permits and yep. for getting to know everybody on the council. And um, it just was, it, it made us feel like we were part of this community yeah and, and so it never seemed like work at all well i remember going to city council meetings with you yep. because you were pushing for various things oh my that gosh remember when i <laughs> yeah because there was a time and well you know where ocean city was going to ban body boards during the day yes and I was like, "Oh wait, this is oh, yeah. this is how I get in the but water." At that point, your parents but, had a beach stand, right? Yeah. We had one when I was younger. We had younger, gotten rid okay. of them by then, I think. But yeah, yeah. I mean, but, the, the local economy was going to be impacted by that heavily. Yeah. And and there were councilmen, and there, and I think even the captain of the beach patrol at that point was trying to make it sound like body boards were hard and had hard oh, centers right. like, yeah. like surfboards. Uh -huh. And we all were like, no, you know, they're yes. soft, they're pliable. And if you remember, I went to a council meeting 
and sawed my body board in half. <laughs> I think I was, was there. And it was not an old throwaway. It was my board wow. that I was using then. And Mary I went Lee. in and sawed it in Mary half Lee to show you with them. Sure. Yeah, and, yeah. Yes. Mary Lee definitely got me yeah. another board. Sawed but the board in half, yes. but um, um, I was <laughs> not dramatic. one to be reckoned with, you know. And yes. that's another whole story. But back in our college days, we both were very politically active. And, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, but it was also Put me we, in the you wanted of a to fight, write in an injustice gonna, yeah. like that. But yeah. we also knew that, and we had backup from some of the people that had the beach stands because these right. guys were they paying were a lot of money oh, sure. to yeah. have those leases on the beach, and they yeah. replaced the rafts completely with body. A hundred percent. Yeah. And not to mention all the little beach stores that sold the cheapo body yeah. words. They yeah. would have been screwed so as well. So it was a huge economic thing too. We had that behind us. I mean, it wasn't just. You know, they didn't just give it to us because, well, we like the kids. Yeah, <laughs> right. It really helped to have an economic impetus there, too. Yeah. And but, then, yeah, I'm sorry, was, go ahead. Well, it's just that I think that really um, made Ocean City stand out on the whole eastern seaboard, you know, and then other towns that might have been considering it yeah. followed Ocean City's lead and um, and let people still go out and bodyboard. Yeah, you, know, you set during, a precedent. The time. Yeah. And another thing, I'll just sidebar this during your tenure, is I had qualified to compete at Pipeline a few years in a row, and you guys did a fundraiser event yeah. to help me raise money to go to Hawaii. So yeah. thank you again for that. That was <laughs> I mean, 40 years ago, but I, I haven't forgotten. So thank yeah, you very yeah. much on that one. You know, when she was talking about the, the community, I mean, it was it was always so exciting for us when some of our surfers or our bodyboarders did something special, yeah, it was like, you know, yeah, Ocean City Pride, you yeah, know, like oh, right. so and so went to the Easterns and they placed second in their division. It's yeah, like, oh, that's so cool. You know, you you kind of get excited about right. That. I know. I remember being stoked on that. Anytime we'd be at the award ceremony and somebody from our district would get, you know, in the final, you'd yeah. be like, yeah, yeah. Maryland. Cause yeah. you're used to hearing central Florida, <laughs> South, South central yeah. Florida, you know, yeah. Florida, Florida, Florida. Body, yeah. Whatever. Bodyboarding. We're hardcore. We surf in booties, gloves, and hoods. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even know there was a beach in Maryland. Yeah. yeah they Where's, no Maryland? <laughs> Where's Maryland? Where's <laughs> Maryland? I still get that when yeah. I'm in California. I tell yep, people yep. I'm, I'm from here, but yeah. So you, you did that first stint running the district, then you took over the executive directorship of the entire ESA. What possessed you to take on that task? Because that's a daunting task. So when, when Doc Kutcher passed away, um, this sort of ad hoc committee of members of the ESA board and the competition director and some of the district directors that were, you know, had more long-term district directors, we all kind of came together to say, okay, you know, what do we do? What do we do? And um, we all met up in New York, and it was winter, and it was freezing cold, and Russ Atwell was the competition director then. He came up from Florida, um, and he was freezing. <laughs> He's like, I can't believe how cold. What am I doing up here? And so we, you know, we had this big weekend meeting to sort of map out where we would go from there, and it was, you know, well, somebody's got to step in to be at least the spokesperson for the ESA. Uh, Everybody if not, then kind of looked and, at her and went. Yeah, and it was like, oh, so whoever is interested in doing that, take one step forward. And everybody took a step back, oh, you know, faster man. than me. Yeah, so. <laughs> and and, uh, I, and you know what? I, I wasn't working full time then. Yeah. And um, Well, and I, I remember I said, uh, so, okay. But here's the deal. If she's going to do it, it has to be a salaried position. Yeah. Because I was going to say, we can't, did we they can't offer it? Yeah. And afford this. You know, we're living on my early teaching, teaching <laughs> degree, teaching earnings, which yeah. were, you know, pretty paltry. And <clears throat> so it became a paid position. It was, wasn't very much. Supp either. It was supposed to be a part time, yeah. part time paid position. But. Over the years, it quickly grew into full time, sure. and um, um, and that was a wonderful experience because now, now I'm representing the whole East Coast of surfing to the surfing world, yes. and um, and had to get involved with California not only to maintain sponsors 
for the ESA because the whole surf industry was on the West Coast. Yeah. And like 60% of the surf industry's revenues came from the East Coast and they put back like maybe a half of 1%. Yeah, isn't that you know? funny? So, so this gave me an opportunity to go up and down the West Coast a couple times a year. And, and you know, we had, I mean, Maury Bodyboard stayed with us for the longest time. O'Neill. And O'Neill um, stuck by us for the longest time. And that helped me open doors to other, you know, national companies. And um, so, you know, it, it gave me, I did continue what Doc had been doing before me, which was to make sure that like at the U.S. championships, that the East Coast got its fair share yeah. of representation at, at the U.S. championships. Because back then, you know, that was, that was it, was the U.S. championships. And yeah, then that was the there, pinnacle. There, well, and then there was the U.S. team that would go, you know, to internet, to but it was different than what, it, I don't know. I, I don't like where um, things just changed a lot after after I was executive director of the ESA. Things which which begs really the question, apart. what do you feel like your legacy is when with your tenure as executive director, the thing you're most proud of accomplishing? I think it was building up the size of the ESA and, um, you know, taking it from, I mean, Doc had built it from, you know, hundreds of members to a couple thousand members. And then I built it up to around 10,000 members. And I kind of laid groundwork for the executive directors that came in behind me to just take that model and, you know, and, and continue with it. And, and I have to really give props to ESA's current executive director, Michelle Summers, because, you know, there were big changes that happened within the surf industry. I mean, first of all, with bodyboarding, Maury went away. Mm. Um, and, um, and the surf industry itself, all these small companies that, I mean, they were big in the scope of things, but they weren't mega companies, uh, you know, they were supporting amateur surfing mm -hmm. um, as well as professional surfing. But then they started um, getting eaten up by um, uh, Madison Avenue, you know, companies. And, and they lost their personality and, and, yeah. they, and they lost the ability to put funding out to the East Coast. And so by the time Michelle Summers came in here to um, run the ESA, she had to um, kind of start all over again because they're just, she had to find new ways of revenue to keep the Easterns, wow. the big event that it had grown into without, you know, tens of thousands of dollars coming in. I mean, that was my work every year was to go out to California or go to Surf Expo and get contracts signed with all these different companies um, to, and, to that finance was, the event. You know, to, to keep financing the Easterns and, and the three regional championships. And um, so, you know, kudos to, to Michelle um, because she has figured out a way to um, still prevent real, uh, present really professional events yeah. without a lot nice. of support from the surf industry because there really isn't mm -hmm. a well. Yeah. The same kind of surf at, industry at, at today. At the time that you were running it, the pro pro circuit was so far away, so distant, that amateur surfing was a big thing. I mean, even on the West Coast, amateur contests yeah. was you know that's where you that's where you surfed. You didn't. There was no chance of getting into a junior pro or taking you know getting into these pro contests. And of course, at that time. You know, if you were surfing, chances are good, you know, if you were a kid, except for the very few exceptional kids, you didn't have sponsorship except for the local shop, you know, yeah. like, like BB Bombers. If you had a BB Bomber stickers on your on your board, that would be it. Or maybe an O'Neill sticker or a Rip Curl, something like that. But, you know, you didn't have that. And so amateur surfing was the ticket if you were a competitive surfer, if you wanted to get some recognition or you were particularly good. And then uh, what happened is that it, it, the pro situation kind of 
overwhelmed everything else. And now it's, I mean, you have kids who are, you know, their parents literally pack up the family and move to California or Australia to get them into coaching programs mm -hmm. so they can become professional surfers yeah. and make $30,000 a year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, it's insane. And so, work as yeah. a waiter part-time. Yeah. Yeah. But and, um, yeah, it's, it, and it. And sadly, as that transition began to happen, I think that's when we started seeing competitive bodyboarding kind of going wane. by really wane. I mean, you know, the, uh, at that time it was the, yeah, well, WSL, um, yeah, they, you know, they were focusing much more on stand up surfing sure. and there just weren't the same companies within the bodyboard industry. Bodyboarding, mm -hmm. unfortunately, you know, had, had gone back to being rental boogie boards and mm -hmm. selling them at, you know, sensations and wings and for the tourists. And um, you just didn't have an industry of bodyboarding in that lot, would In a lot of ways, bodyboarding, though, is, is more, more, uh, more of the, that kind of hardcore underground yeah. thing going on. Because, yeah. I mean, if you go on YouTube and you look for bodyboarding videos and contests, you find all this stuff from Europe and South Africa and Australia. There's people doing it there, and, you know, it's... It's a core of, you know, very dedicated, very talented individuals. And on in the U.S., it just doesn't have that same following, even though there are lots of bodyboarders. And, um, and e even so, they tend to stay kind of under the radar. I mean, there's not really any, there's, there's no advantage for a kid to come up and say, I'm a bodyboarder and, you know, suddenly have somebody offer them a giant six-figure contract right. because you're the best bodyboarder in the world yeah. you're going to go out and challenge mike stewart at pipeline you know yep. and, you know you could go out and challenge mike stewart at pipeline you could beat him soundly and nobody would pay any attention nobody yeah. would even know but that's not to say that there can't be a renaissance you know i right. I, I because like here locally, Mike Strawley, mm -hmm. who was, you know, just as crazy and rabid a bodyboarder as you or anybody else here back in, in that time, you know, he's got kids of his own now. Mm -hmm. And and he has rediscovered how great it is to be back yeah. out in the water bodyboarding. And, you know, so I'm sure if there's a Mike Strawley in Ocean City, there's Mike Strawley's all over the place yeah. here in the U.S., um, that there might be some way to bring it back together but yeah. i'm not saying that we're interested in yeah. <laughs> putting yeah. something yeah. Uh, putting a tour together but um <laughs> come you know, on we would love you've to done see it, it before <laughs> we on. would love to see it happen out there though now you now like talking about what you just said you guys came back to oh. directing the esa after you were executive director oh, we were crazy and you thought this is the end of the road with the esa i've, I've put in a long number of years supporting this organization i'm ready to step down and then somehow you got sucked back in how'd that happen it just you know it, well, it, in fact that was many years after you had left the yeah i wasn't even i wasn't even working for the esa and, anymore so, i was running another nonprofit at that point that had nothing to do with surfing had everything to so do with clean water what but yeah it was 17 um, 18 i yeah um let's see i started working at act at 2007 so Oh, no, no. We only did the ESA for a couple of years. Yeah. Before Laura took it over. But, but so it was... But, yeah, that the ESA had tanked here um, district-wise, and Michelle had been fishing around for somebody, and she put the word out, and Chris Shanahan from K-Coast said... We really need somebody to do this because it needs. He didn't want to do it, but yeah, no, <laughs> nobody wanted. Nobody to do wanted it. to so do it. So yeah. I, I stepped back in, and uh, we did that for a couple of years. Um, two seasons. Uh, two yeah. seasons again. I mean, it was it was kind of cool. I mean, we got to reconnect with you know the shops, Chauncey and Lee, and you know all those guys supporting the the contests, and we got to put the things on, um, but. Uh, <clears throat> You know, at that point, we were retiring. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, yeah. And, 
And fortunately, Laura Bren came along, and she has two kids who were surfers, and she and her husband Dan took over the district and did a great job building the membership. And completely different, you know, I had a com great conversation with Dan one day. He was talking about all the parents on the beach, and he was kind of complaining a little bit about it because, you know, all of a sudden you have parents who are pushing stuff or maybe being a little bit, inter interfering a little bit with trying to run the contest. And I, I had to laugh. I said, we never had parents on the beach ever when we were running the ESA. In fact, the parents would show up, drop their kids off and leave for the whole day. <laughs> the whole day, yeah. these kids would be on the beach with us, surfing, bodyboarding, whatever, you know, rabid, just in the water. It was like summer camp. Yeah, like except summer camp. for one and day and a weekend. We were like free babysitters yes. for them, or, you know, the were, cost of the entry were, fee. There that were was... contests where we would wrap up, get everything packed in the trailer, packed up, and there'd be these this kid sitting there. And we'd be like, <laughs> we can't uh, leave. Do you have a ride? You know, no I'm cell waiting. phones then. I'm you waiting. couldn't call yeah, their no parents. No cell nope. phones. I'm waiting for my mom. And there was no way I was going to leave a kid <laughs> sitting alone. <laughs> so you give him a ride you know, home? At five o'clock. No, in the we just, I mean, so there was nobody home to take him to. And in that particular case, that kid's mom was a real estate agent, or maybe both his parents were real estate agents. Oh, so they're no. out showing properties. So uh, there was nobody to take him home to. You know, so epic. we would just sit there with him until hang out, somebody buy him would an show ice cream up. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. Just hang out while well, waiting for somebody to pick him up. But I mean, it's funny because when I, the way I grew up in surfing, we, when we went surfing with our friends, we never had our parents. Yeah. Want Nobody around. wanted their parents to come to the beach with them when they went surfing. I, that it's a complete shift. It's, yes. It's a, a, it's a, it's a little shift, league sport now. Yeah. It. You know, it's yeah. like, yeah. you know, I preferred the old days where when I went surfing with my buddies, it was just us. Yeah. And there weren't anybody's parents looking over your shoulder if you said something or you did something really lame or stupid. Right. Your friends would tell you you were lame, but you didn't have somebody's <laughs> father going, oh, no, don't do that. You didn't have that. <laughs> and I kind of prefer that. And that's one of the things that happened in surfing that, that I, I'm kind of like... I cringe when I see people show up at the beach with their kids to go surfing. You know, it's like... Yeah. You're gonna really gonna paddle out with like three small children right here where I'm paddle where I'm <laughs> surfing. You're yeah. gonna do that to me. Yeah. Well, what amazes I me? I will run your children over. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? What baffles me is the pro surfers that all have coaches. To me, that's very foreign because surfing. I mean, you if you've been surfing all your life, you know how to read the waves, or you should know how to read waves and pick yeah. the right waves, and you should know what it takes. Yeah. To win a heat. Why do you need to give a chunk of your earnings to some guy who's just telling you what you already know? But that's the nature of the beast now. Yeah. And kids grow up in that little league framework where parents have a coach for the kid. The kid's homeschooled so they can get more time surfing. Mm -hmm. And they're brought up in the sport, in, at least in surfing. Definitely not in bodyboarding, but in surfing, that's how it is yeah. now, right? And, they all have coaches. And you were brought up in the sport, and I was sort of brought up in the sport, but the sport brought us up. No, yes. There was yeah. no coaching. No, very no. few adults. Had, you know, you probably went home on weekends and said, hey, mom, look, I won the bodyboard contest yeah, today. That's right. You know, and she was exactly. like, great, okay, put it with the others. <laughs> I think once in a while, like once or twice, my dad would duck in for 20 minutes and watch a heat. Yeah. And then I would do a maneuver, and the judges, who were surfers, didn't know what the hell I was doing, would be like, did he just fall off his board? My dad would be like, what the hell? He just did an El Rolo. <laughs> and then he'd leave, and I wouldn't see him, you know? So that was the extent of, you know, my dad's involvement. But, mm. you know, he was always there. The parents were always there, proud of their kids, but they weren't at the events, like yeah. you said. So it's a different time nowadays, yeah. you know? Totally and different. I wonder, you know, I wonder what I wonder what happened to bodyboarding. I, I have, when I've been out where we were surfing this morning. Yep. Uh, there have been a couple couple times I've had other people out bodyboarding. Yep. You know, and uh, they know what they're doing, and it's kind of interesting to see them out there. I don't even know who they are, but uh, you know, there's you know, 
rarely do I see another body boarder in the water. Yeah, way less now. And, you know, we, as, as a retailer now, we see a resurgence of what we call board agains. That's what we call mm. them. And they're what you described earlier. They're older guys that used to do this sport in the 80s and 90s. Then they got married and got jobs and kind of didn't have time for it. And now their kids are getting into the ocean. And so they're coming back yeah. to the sport. So there is that. But but the the kids, we at least in my point of view, is they're not sticking with bodyboarding. They're seeing the WSL yeah. and yeah. how you know glamorous the WSL yeah. is. And they kind of more aspire to pro surfing yeah. as a result of that. And bodyboarding, you mentioned, Kathy, that the, you know, Maury backed out of the ESA long ago. And part of the problem with the bodyboard industry is there's so many companies that make the boards now. There's so many. There's got to be 60 or 70 brands now. Mm. And back in those days, there was like maybe five, five brands yeah. dominating the industry. So they were all making a good amount of money. They could afford to do yeah. things like sponsor the ESA. Now everyone's splitting that same pie 60 ways that mm. used to split it five ways. Yeah. And nobody can make enough to support the sport. So com competitive bodyboarding in the U.S. has suffered as a result. And in fact, in California, we didn't have any events for like a decade and just recently a, a, a group actually a guy from hawaii it was the impetus behind it has tried to they've they've organized a small circuit out there but it's you know they don't even fill every event so it's you know yeah. it's it's just in a transition time and yeah. i don't know where it's well, going to end up and i you know for me bodyboarding is kind of interesting because you know of course i used to do them occasionally when Mary Lee would come to town with a tour and stuff, but you know, never was interested in it. Uh, and I'm gonna give props to Charlie Birch, who's passed away, but from Virginia. And Charlie had some serious health issues, uh, heart heart operation and some infections. And he said, you know, I ran into him one day. He said, Well, he said, he says, I know all, and he had, you know, Virginia accent, I know all these guys and they used to just surf. They were the best surfers, but now they can't surf as good as they used to, so they just quit. Yeah. And he says, I've got to be in the water. i got to be in the water, so i got a bodyboard, and that's what I've been doing. And I ran into a problem where I had arthritis and tears in my shoulder, you know, my all kinds of screwed up stuff in my shoulder, and I, I, had to, I couldn't push up on a surfboard. I just had to stop. And... Um, so yeah, Charlie's, I, Charlie's voice Charlie's was in his voice head. voice was in my head, so like, I grabbed yep. her bodyboard and uh, got a pair, of, I had a pair of fins, and I went out and I started bodyboarding. And uh, then I developed arthritis in my hands and still couldn't surf until I got that treated. And so I've just been bodyboarding because it allows me to get in the water. And, you know, I'm actually, it's, it's funny because... I've been watching the videos. I watch your videos. I watch all these videos like, okay, how do I do this? How do I do that? And trying to get better, you can, you can bodyboard instantaneously without much experience. Right. But if you want to get better, it's very tricky. And especially if you're a surfer, it's a whole different set of guidelines of what works and how it works. Yeah. So I've been learning that and um, I've been having a really good time. I mean, days like today... Yes. I'm, I'm like, you know, because it was thumping and it was coming right over. I'm, I can go out on a bodyboard and I can catch waves and not, you know, not be pitched too many times. <laughs> and, and yeah. you know, I watch guys go out on surfboards who are, you know, um, unless they're pretty darn good, can't catch waves. And, you know, you see them pulling back, pulling back. Whereas you sit on a bodyboard, you can sit inside and a couple strokes you're in and you're gone. And yeah. it's like... So it's been, it's really been a lot of fun to. to well, it's learn. yeah, it's reopened sort of performance wave riding to you with the injuries and the arthritis yeah. that you didn't think was possible. And we see a lot of that at eBodyboard. We got guys coming in who have 
knee problems, hip problems, shoulder yep. problems, surfing all their lives, 40, 50 years, yep. and they're frustrated, but they want to keep riding waves. So they come in and go, I, I want a bodyboard. I know how to ride waves. I've been doing it all my life, yep. but I can't stand up because of these reasons. And yep. so they, they switch over. Did you feel self-conscious when you oh, first yeah. started bodyboarding because you knew all these guys oh, it's, and it's, they they're like looking at you now what you're on a it's, boogie board it's, it's funny you mentioned that because when i first started doing it, i would slink off and do it all by myself <laughs> right i would do it where there was nobody around and i'd be like this is fun i'm having a good time and now you know what's happened is on more than a few occasions i've been out there you know like i like i mentioned laura and dan bren and um <laughs> Uh, I remember one, one day I was out bodyboarding and, and Dan showed up with his kids and he goes, I saw you get a ripping wave across. Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, cool. I feel good now. You know? uh, Got a compliment. So, yes. Yeah. So I, I stopped, stopped worrying at, about it. And what I really like now is that, you know, we have still have the black ball. And if the waves are getting good right around 10 o'clock, yeah. I can just kind of paddle out and just kind of lurk there until they all yes. have to leave and then have it all to myself. We used to do that at the inlet before the inlet was yep. a permanent surfing beach here. Mike Strawley and yep. myself and Bill Wilkins and Glenn Brown, we would just sit on the beach, get there at like 930, yep. just wait. sit there and wait. And all the surfers who we all knew would get out and just grumble at us because they knew <laughs> it was firing and we were going to have it all to ourselves. Yep. So those were good times. Yeah, and, and, and to go back to the before the mores. You you had mentioned in one of your things about you were bodyboard you were you were riding rafts yeah and yeah. I had a raft and I actually was would take those cheap flip flops and cut them in half and <laughs> make glue them onto out. the oh. bottom of the board to make fins Whoa. so I could so I could ride it at the inlet oh it would usually God. only last one or two waves before it would fall off oh my gosh that's <laughs> but, so uh, funny yeah I, I would we. There were a couple of us. We'd go down to the inlet and ride the, because the inlet had a great wave. I mean, it would peak yeah. up and you know it would you know wind out away from the rocks. Yeah. And, you know, if you had a raft and you knew how to ride it, which we didn't really know, but if you, you know, wanted to be in the water in the middle of the day, it was the way to do it. It's funny, mat riding has made a resurgence now. Yeah. We sell surf mats, and yeah. they, they sell very well. People I've, are back. We have one, one. And I've tried to ride it a few times, and they're even harder. <laughs> they're really hard. Yeah, to, there's to a ride. totally different technique yeah. than bodyboarding, because we took one to Fiji and on a couple other trips, and Vicky rode it like a bodyboard, and the dude who makes them in Australia was emailing Vicky and saying, you, no, you yeah, can't right. ride it like a bodyboard. You got to do this with your hands and squeeze it and bend yeah, it and yeah, all this. Yeah. So I she's, know, we yeah. would watch all of his videos yeah. to figure out how to make that thing work. Yeah, for us. I have two yeah. buddies who are really into it. Because like, it's great. It's yeah, you do deflate now. it. It doesn't yeah. take up any space. Yeah, you just roll it up. Yeah. Bad enough when yeah. we go any place. We're hauling a kayak. We're hauling a bodyboard. We're hauling at least one surfboard. We're yeah. hauling bicycles, you know. <laughs> so yeah, I get To it. have one all more piece of equipment for the well, water. That, and that's uh, the other thing I got I to gotta say that I really, really, really like about bodyboarding. It's yeah. the equipment. Oh, yeah. Pair of fins and a bodyboard, man. It's nothing. I can pick it up, throw it in the back of my truck, go get in the water, come back, throw it back in the truck. I don't have to tie anything on racks. It's yeah. So, it's so nice. If I'm going to travel, I can take a bodyboard. Well, you guys probably know this. The, the average, the, the original bodyboards were around 42 inches long. But Tom's original board, the first one he ever shaped in 71, is like, I don't want to say it's like 48 or 50 inches long. It's very hmm. long. And the reason boards came down in size, do you guys know? It's I, kind you, of an interesting you had it story. In one of your podcast, I saw yeah. you mention that. It's all uh, UPS fit, regulations yep. fit, to fit, fit in a box the that they were allowed to send through the U.S. Postal Service, not <laughs> yeah. UPS, but USPS. And that was it. And that became sort of the, you know, the, the, um, the standard. Size, yeah. yeah. The default size for bodyboards yeah. and, and, and eventually but it changed. It's them, a but. good size. It actually works yeah, better. It does. You know? And people figured out how to yeah. ride them yeah. properly at that size. But 
yeah, it's funny how, how it turned out that way. But yeah, it's, you know, I, I go back to, you know, the ESA bringing up bodyboarding in this area. And then now it's kind of on the downswing. And now the ESA has eliminated the division. It's because yeah. there's just, they say, Michelle tells me there's not enough people signing up for the bodyboarding yeah, division. Not. Yeah, there's not. Yeah. And, and it, it basically just became a way to get little kids into competitive surfing, but then they would just you know, after maybe one season on a bodyboard, then they wanted the surfboard. Yeah, and, right. And, and the parents wanted them on a surfboard. Sure. That's another thing, yeah. too. Yeah, and it's know, a shame, so. too, because the last contest that I I was judging, there was one kid, one young kid, who was really a good bodyboarder. I mean, most of them were like little little kids who just rode the white water. Yep. And this one kid went out and he gave Strawley a run for his money. <laughs> he was good. I don't even yeah. know what his name was, but you know, he needs to be he needs a, a showcase <laughs> to uh to do that. I told Mike, I said, you just need a clip some clipboards and a card table. See if the ESA will help help you set up a, the permits and run an event that's just for bodyboards. And, yeah. And do a few of those and and if it's successful and people have fun, you'll have people coming out of the woodwork. Yeah, right? East Coast parents get out there. You know, I, I like to think another reason that it kind of built up, obviously that was the heyday of the sport back in those days in the 80s. And part of that was the grassroots efforts of Maury doing the clinics, the yeah. jamborees, yeah. jamborees, bringing yeah. new people into the sport because we would show up at a beach in Florida, Virginia Beach or New Jersey, and tourists would show up. No yeah. wave riding experience, and as you guys pointed out, the barrier to entry is very low in bodyboarding. Yeah. You literally just have to lay on the board and hold on, right, yeah. to do it at the very basic level, and we would get people hooked on the sport. Yeah. They would literally go to the store from our promo and buy the gear and come back and say, look, I just bought yeah. this board because <laughs> you took, guys took me out this morning. I had so much fun, right? So... That's kind of where I see things going. If we, if we want to bring new people into the sport, is back to the grassroots level. You know, uh, Vicky and I are doing a bodyboard camp in yep. San Clemente this Saw summer that. through the city of San Clemente. We and, sent you um, out that T-shirt that we dug up out. That's of the right, garage. which I have on our Instagram. I posted <laughs> yeah. a shot. It's so real classic. bodyboard yeah. camp. Right, I still city. remember going out with little kids, and we would take these little kids out for the when we did it for the city. Yeah, and take them yeah. out and get them on a bodyboard and push them in. And, you know, some of them were terrified and some of them were just like, this is the most fun thing <laughs> ever. Right. You know, I'm sure they'd been, that's right. Would otherwise have been stuck on the beach with mom saying, you know, don't go near the water. Yeah. Or, you know, it's not safe or be careful. And all of a sudden they're out there and, you know, they're like, you know, what are we 10 years old or eight years old? And somebody's pushing them into a wave and they get that rush. And, you yep. know, some of them, just lit up well you know that's how it was for all of us the first time yeah. we rode a wave yeah. we lit up and, it, mm. and we tried to keep that light alive and for yeah. me it's been 44 years riding waves and for you guys a little bit longer and but you're <laughs> oh, still God. interested i mean you still in the water too kathy in the summer when it's warmer yeah I it's got to be the right temperature sure. and the right kind of swell and yeah you know, but she but i has a photo we uh what was it how many years ago? It was a few years ago. We were down and we did the wave pool oh, at we did, Disney. Yeah. Oh, we did. Yeah. Oh, Typhoon Lagoon. I yeah. love yeah. doing that. I nice, love the wave pool because nice I know exactly too. what's coming. Well, then nice, why nice don't you come yeah. to Texas with us? Rail and yeah, I know that would be incredible. <laughs> you were going to come to Texas with us. You were inquiring. Yeah. Now we we're might. going to Surf Ranch for the second time in December. Yeah, and then we're gonna go surf uh, back to Waco again as well. In I a would. Couple weeks, I, so. I would love to go to Waco. I think yeah, you would too. Yeah, super fun. We have yeah. To, yeah, we have to think about that. Yeah, <laughs> consider it because we'd love to have you. It would be super cool. So and we have, you know. I just have other blast. ways to keep myself in or on the water because I've got a little little sailboat now, yes. Phantom, and uh, finally got that all restored and got a trailer for it so this summer I'll get back into sailing again because that's what I I used to sail with my dad on the Chesapeake yeah. Bay in a nice big sloop and yeah so you, you have a lot of connections to, get... to the water I you know yeah. we she briefly touched on it she ran Assateague Coast Keeper 
for a long time. 15 years. Yeah, looking oh. after the health of the um, the bay, Cinepuxent Bay, Assawoman Bay, the bays around this, all around yep. the eastern shore. And, uh, well, the, the lower shore. And, yeah. yeah. So, and, uh, um, yeah, and you had that connection probably that started back in the sailing days with your yeah. dad. Yep. And just, just being in the water, I mean, you know, surfing, bodyboarding, um, you know, I've seen the change in water yeah. quality over the years. And so I did my part for about 15 Thank years you for that. to try to, yes. try to uh, hold polluters accountable as yeah. best we could and keep things uh, clean and keep the water clean and safe for everybody. There's a network and, of coast keepers around the country, too. Yeah, it's uh, uh, the, the organization, it's an international organization called Waterkeeper Alliance. And it's um, people just like me, local to their watershed, to their mm. water body, um, just ordinary, you know, citizens. Yeah. Some are lawyers, but some just like me were, you know, just housewives or, <laughs> or whatever, ran surfing organizations. Yeah. And, um, you know, we just saw the need for making sure that clean water laws were being uh, followed and the government was doing their job to, you know, keep hold polluters accountable yeah and um so some of your viewers uh, might be like familiar with the los angeles water keeper um or uh santa barbara santa barbara coast keep let's see santa barbara is i think also a water keeper um but anyway there's coast keepers there's water keepers river keepers san francisco uh, bay keeper. yeah san francisco <clears throat> bay keeper um and they're all up and down. They're, they're throughout the whole U.S. and now in uh, something, I don't know how many countries throughout the world now. Wow. And uh, it's a, yeah, that's a, it's a great organization sure. and um, really fulfilling work. Good for you. And it, right and it you know, connects to surfing, to bodyboarding, to anybody, you know, that wants to be out in the water and feel like um, it's safe to go swimming, surfing, bodyboarding. Well, you guys, it, we've been, I think we went a little yeah, over my target of 30 minutes, oh, but man, we, story we did cover, so we fun. could go on and on. We've covered so much ground, but you know, the thing about these two of the, is they've given a ton of their lives no, to promoting no surfing and bodyboarding and <clears throat> taking care of the, the waterways around this area and elsewhere. And just, you know, kind of a thankless job in a lot of ways. So for me personally, thank you so much for all that you guys have done. And I'm so stoked to see you guys still in the water. Saw you in the water this morning, Jeff. And man, you know, I still say I don't trust a guy your age that doesn't have full head of gray hair. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but at least you have hair, unlike me. So no, I'm just kidding, of course. But well, um, And you know, and... and <laughs> we've, we've seen so many of the kids that came up through the Eastern Surfing Association succeed in, in life. And, you know, I mean, you are just a great example that you have this amazing company now that, that you run. And, you know, you did your stint as a pro bodyboarder. Mm. But, um, you know, just like, like with us, we knew that we couldn't bartend the rest of our lives, yeah. you know. <laughs> right, and, right. So he became a teacher, and somehow I found my way into the nonprofit world. You know, and, and now you've got yeah. ebodyboarding.com, and well, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting. Thanks. I mean, you know, I saw that you guys have the stuff for the, you know, for the junior lifeguards and everything. Yeah. And <clears throat> getting involved with your community and doing something where you volunteer is, it's really, it, it's never, it's a burden when you're doing it sometimes, but it always gives back more than you, more than you put in. I mean, yep. you know, from... You know, the people, the connections we know, we've made, the friends we have, you know, that we can travel up and down the East Coast and travel anywhere. anywhere. Yeah. We and get off a, a plane and, and somebody plane goes, hey, Jeff Phillips. Yes. And we're like, yeah. and, oh, yeah. my gosh. <laughs> right. Right. Somebody who, who was surfed our contests when they were a kid, you know, and so we, you know, we have that. And, and just the fact that, you know, I, I keep saying to pe people, you know, like, how come you, you guys don't? look or act like you're as old as you are and i say it's because all of our friends are younger yeah <laughs> they keep you young yeah yep and we definitely. have to keep up with them yes and i always used to tell people about surfing and it's the same way with bodyboarding when you go out in the water it doesn't matter who you are how old you are 
the ocean doesn't care. Yes. And if you want a wave, you've got to get that wave. And if the guy next to you is 14 and you're 55 or whatever, you got to earn that wave from him. Yeah. You can't just be sitting back there going, oh, you should give me that wave, kid, because he's just Because I'm an elder. Right. <laughs> it you know, doesn't yeah. work so that you way. Gotta, you got to stay stay on top of it and you got to be competitive. And, uh, but then you're going to, you do that. You're going to come in, you're going to have a 14-year-old you can talk to. Hey, did you see my way? True. Yeah. yeah, you got that connection despite yep. the age gap. Yep. The surfing is, you know, the ultimate bonding thing and for all of us. You can't, you know, you, you can't play. There's a lot of sports you can't do your whole life. True. But surfing and bodyboarding are, yeah. are those kind of sports you can do them till you basically can't hardly move anymore. Yeah, you just got, well, that's the secret. You got to keep moving yeah. <laughs> your whole life. Don't get sedentary or then yeah. those skills will go away or the ability to do it goes away. So, yeah. So a lot of lessons learned here in this show. A lot of ground covered <laughs> guys. It's well, been I'm so a pleasure. glad you came over. And oh, yeah. yeah. We got to talk story with you for a while. Yeah, and, well, um, I know. We might have to do a follow-up because there's other t- <laughs> topics that we didn't get to, but what a pleasure to talk to these two. We've known each other for 43 years now, <laughs> and we still keep in touch, and uh, and we will continue to keep in touch, and maybe we'll get some waves again together. You know, next time you come to California, let's get a session in. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And, uh, yeah, right. that'll be fun. So, guys, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. and, um, guys, if you enjoyed the show, give us a thumbs up. Even if you didn't, be nice and give us a thumbs up. <laughs> no, no thumbs down. Um, throw some comments if you're watching on YouTube. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you listened on the audio podcast, hope you enjoyed this during your drive, workout, or whatever it is you do uh, while you listen to podcasts. And uh, we will see you on the next Real Deal show. And as always, we'll see you in the surf.